And we're back. I have some more success stories to share with you. These are from Neville Goddard. And this book is called The Power of Imagination. It is a treasury of his works. And the work that I'm going to be reading from today is called The Law and the Promise. It is chock full of success stories. I picked three of my favorites and some of Neville's commentary to go along with it. So let me start here. This is one of my favorite stories of all time to share. I have referred back to it time and time again for myself. It is such an excellent example of how to use the imagination more than we use our action to help things come to pass. Uh, the name of this chapter is called Dwell Therein. And here's Neville's intro to this story. Man is all imagination. Therefore, man must be where he is in imagination, for his imagination is himself. To realize that imagination is not something tied to the scenes or enclosed within the spatial boundary of the body is most important. Although man moves about in space by movement of his physical body, he need not be so restricted. He can move by a change in what he is aware of. However, the real scene on which sight rests, man can gaze on one never before witnessed. It's all in here first, my friends. He can always remove the mountain if it upsets his concept of what life ought to be. This ability to mentally move from things as they are to things as they ought to be is one of the most important discoveries that man can make. In other words, if you don't like what you're seeing in your 3D world, don't worry about it. You can change that by doing the internal work through your imagination. If there's any result in your 3D world that you would like to change, it is as simple as choosing to stop reacting to your 3D world. Use that as information on how to create a new scene in your mind or new affirmations, and then go inside and do the internal work. It reveals man as a center of imagining with powers of intervention, which enable him to alter the course of observed events, moving from success to success through series of mental transformations of nature, of others, and of himself. Here's the story. For many years, a doctor and his wife dreamed about their stately habitation, but not until they imaginatively lived in it did they manifest it. Here is their story. Some 15 years ago, Mrs. M and I purchased a lot on which we built a two-story building housing our office and living area. We left ample space on the lot for an apartment building, if and when our finances would permit. All those years, we were busy paying off our mortgage, and at the end of that time, had no money for the additional building we still desired so much. It was true that we had an ample savings account, which meant security for our business, but to use any part of it for a new building would be to jeopardize that security. But now your teaching awakened a new concept, boldly telling us we could have what we most desired through the controlled use of our imagination, and that realizing a desire was made more convincing without money. We decided to put it to a test and forget about money and concentrate our attention on the thing we desired most in this world, the new apartment building. And I love this because they're setting up multiple streams of income. With this principle in mind, we mentally constructed the new building as we wanted it, actually drawing physical plans so we could better formulate our mental picture of the completed structure. Never forgetting to think from the end, in our case, the completed occupied building, we took many imaginative trips through our apartment house, 
renting the units to imaginary tenants, examining in detail every room and enjoying the feeling of pride as friends offered congratulations on the unique planning. We brought into our imaginal scene one friend in particular. I shall call her Mrs. X. A lady we had not seen for some time as she had given us up socially, believing us a bit peculiar in our new way of thinking. In our imaginal scene, we took her through the building and asked her how she liked it. Hearing her voice distinctly, we heard her reply, doctor, I think it's beautiful. One day while talking together of our building, my wife mentioned a contractor who had constructed several apartment houses in our neighborhood. We knew of him only by the name that appeared on signs adjacent to buildings under construction. But realizing that if we were living in the end, we would not be looking for a contractor, we promptly forgot this angle. Continuing these periods of daily imagining for several weeks, we both felt we were now fused with our desire and had successfully been living in the end. Remember, you have to pick up that little paper doll version of yourself and walk around in your imagined reality as if you already have the thing. Look at what the doctor and his wife were doing. They were not out there talking to contractors and worrying about all these little pieces in the middle. They weren't worrying about the money. They were simply spending time every day together, imagining the scene in their mind where they would invite Mrs. X and other friends over, and they would walk around and show off this apartment building. They were doing all of the work in their imagination, not in their 3D world. One day a stranger entered our office and identified himself as the contractor whose name my wife had mentioned weeks before. In an apologetic manner, he said, I don't know why I stopped here. I normally don't go to see people, but rather people come to see me. He explained that he passed our office often and had wondered why there wasn't an apartment building on the corner lot. We assured him we would like very much to see an apartment building there, but we had no money to put into the project, not even a few hundred dollars it would take to make the plans. Our negative response did not phase him and seemingly compelled, he began to figure and devise ways and means to carry out the job, unasked and unencouraged by us. Forgetting the incident, we were quite startled when a few days later this man called, informing us that plans were completed and that the proposed building would cost us $30,000. We thanked him politely and did absolutely nothing. We knew we had been living imaginatively in the end of a completed building and that imagination would assemble that building perfectly without any outside assistance from us. So we were not surprised when the contractor called again the next day to say he had found a set of blueprints in his files that fitted our needs perfectly with few alterations. This, we were informed, would save us the architect's fee for the new plans. We thanked him again and still did nothing. Logical thinkers would insist that such negative response from prospective customers would completely end the matter. Instead, two days later, the contractor again called with the news that he had located a finance company willing to cover the necessary loan with the exception of a few thousand dollars. It sounds incredible, but we still did nothing. For remember, to us, this building was completed and rented. And in our imagination, we had not put one penny into its construction. Remember, logical thinking is what holds you stuck. If logic dictated the world, we would not be flying. We would not have put a man on the moon. We would not be listening to each other and talking on Zoom right now. We would not have computers that we carry around in our hands. Those things at one point were all completely illogical. You cannot allow yourself to be governed by your conscious mind only. That's your logical mind. Remember, creation takes place in your subconscious mind, your emotional mind. So notice what they're doing. 
They're doing all of the work inside. The balance of this tale reads like a sequel to Alice in Wonderland, for the contractor came to our office the next day and said, as though presenting us with a gift, you people are going to have that new building anyway. I've decided to finance the balance of the loan myself. If this is agreeable, I'll have my lawyer draw up the papers and you can pay me back out of the net profits from the rentals. This time we did do something. We signed the papers and construction began immediately. Most of the apartment units were rented before final completion and all but one occupied the day of completion. We were so thrilled by the seemingly miraculous events of the past few months that for a while we didn't understand the seeming flaw in our imaginal picture. But knowing what we had already accomplished through the, through the power of imagining, we immediately conceived another imaginal scene and in it this time, instead of showing the party through the unit and hearing the words, we'll take it, we ourselves in imagination visited tenants who had already moved into that apartment. We allowed them to show us through the rooms and heard their pleased and satisfied comments. Three days later, that apartment was rented. Our original imaginary drama had objectified itself in every detail, save one. And that one became a reality when one month later, our friend, Mrs. X, surprised us with a long overdue visit expressing her desire to see our new building. Gladly, we let her through, and at the end of the tour, heard her speak the line we had heard in our imagination so many weeks before. As with emphasis on each word, she said, Doctor, I think it is beautiful. Our dream of 15 years was realized, and we know now that it could have been realized any time within those 15 years if we had known the secret of imagining and how to live in the end of desire. But now it was realized. Our one big desire was objectified and we did not put one penny of our own money into it, Dr. M. Neville goes on to say, through the medium of a dream, a controlled waking dream, the doctor and his wife created reality. They learned how to live in their dream house, in fact, as now they do. Although help seemingly came from without, the course of events was ultimately determined by the imaginal activity of the doctor and his wife. The participants were drawn into their imaginal drama because it was dramatically necessary that they should be. Their imaginal structure demanded it. Mm, such a delicious story. I love that one, one of my very favorites. Now we have another one from the chapter called Turn the Wheel Backward. And this story is from a gentleman by the name of F.B. Late in July, I wrote to a real estate agent of my desire to sell a piece of land which had been a financial burden to me. His negative reply listed all the reasons why sales were at a standstill in that area and he forecast a bleak period of waiting until after the first of the year. I received his letter on a Tuesday, and in my imagination, I rewrote it with words indicating that the agent was eager to take my listing. I read this revised letter over and over, and I extended my imaginal drama using your theme of the four mighty ones of our imagination from your book, Seed Time and Harvest. The producer, the author, the director, and the actor. Are you seeing any similarities to chapter six in thinking into results? All of this is tied to your imagination. It's tied to that writing the script of you, uh, your self-image. If your life was a movie, what would you do to create it exactly the way that you want? This Right here might be where this, this uh, chapter six in thinking into results comes from. In my imaginal scene as producer, he says, I suggested the theme, the lot is sold for a profit. As the author, I wrote the simple scene, which to me implied fulfillment. 
Standing in the real estate office, I extended my hand to the agent and said, thank you, sir. And he replied, it was a pleasure doing business with you. As director, I rehearsed myself as actor until that scene was vividly real. And I felt the relief, which would be mine if the burden were really lifted. Three days later, the agent I had originally written phoned me saying he had a deposit for my lot and the price I had specified, at the price I had specified. I signed the papers in his office the next day, extended my hand and said, thank you, sir. The agent replied, it was a pleasure doing business with you. Five days later, I had constructed and enacted an imaginal scene Five days after I had constructed and enacted an imaginal scene, it became a physical reality and was played word for word just as I had heard it in my imagination. The feeling of relief and joy came, not so much from selling the property, but from the inconvertible proof that my imagined drama worked. FB. Neville says, if the thing accomplished were all, how futile. But F.B. discovered a power within himself that can consciously create circumstances by mentally falsifying the facts of life, meaning the 3D world. Man moves from passive reaction to active creation. This breaks the wheel of recurrence and builds a cumulatively enlarging future. If man does not always create in the sense of the full sense of the word, it is because he is not faithful to his vision or else he thinks of what he wants rather than from his wish fulfilled. It's all about living in the end. And that is a perfect example of how he was able to do that. Last story here. A year ago, I took my children to Europe, leaving my furnished apartment in the care of my maid. When we returned a few months later to the United States, I found my maid and all of my furniture gone. The apartment superintendent stated that the maid had my furniture moved by my request. There was nothing I could do at the moment. So I took my children and moved into a hotel. I, of course, reported the incident to the police and also brought in private detectives on the case. Both organizations investigated every moving company and every storage warehouse in New York City, but to no avail. There seemed to be absolutely no trace of my furniture, nor of my maid. Having exhausted all outside sources, I remembered your teaching and decided I would try using my imagination in this matter. So, while seated in my hotel room, I closed my eyes and imagined myself in my own apartment, sitting in my favorite chair, surrounded by all of my personal furnishings. I looked across the living room at the piano on which I kept pictures of my children. I would continue to stare at my piano until the entire room became vividly real to me. I could see my children's pictures and actually feel the upholstery of the chair in which, in my imagination, I sat. The next day, as I came out of my bank, I turned to walk in the direction of my vacant apartment instead of toward my hotel. When I reached the corner, I discovered my mistake and was just about to turn back when my attention was drawn to a very familiar pair of ankles. Yes. The ankles belonged to my maid. I walked up to her and took hold of her arm. She was quite frightened, but I assured her all I wanted from her was my furniture. I called a taxi and she took me to the place in which her friends had stored my furnishings. In one day, my imagination had found what an entire big city police force and private investigators could not find in weeks. Neville says, this lady knew the secret of imagining before she called the police, but imagining, in spite of its importance, was forgotten owing to attention being fixed on facts. However, what reason failed to find by force, imagining found without effort. 
Nothing merely goes on, including the sense of loss, without its imaginal support. By imagining that she was seated in her own chair, in her own living room, surrounded by all of her own furnishings, she withdrew the imaginal support she had given to the sense of loss. So important, take your attention off of the negative and put your attention onto the positive result that you want. By this imaginal change, she recovered her lost furniture and reestablished her home. Your imagination is most creative when you imagine things as you desire them to be, building a new experience out of a dream of fancy. To build such a dream of fancy in her imagination, uh, <clears throat> R.O., the lady who wrote the story about her missing furniture, was able to retrieve it. So that's what I have for you from Neville. Thank you so much for listening. If I can help you further, you know where to find me. I'm Lauren Weibert, and I'm your mindset coach. See you again soon.